<clears throat> Take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 8, and we'll be reading verses 9 through 25, continuing our sermon series through the book of Acts. You'll remember Stephen became the first Christian martyr, and after Stephen died in Jerusalem, a great persecution broke out on the saints in Jerusalem, and the Christians were scattered throughout Judea and then on into Samaria. But in the providence of God, as those Christians were scattered from the comfort of their homes, the gospel was scattered too. And the good news of Jesus was proclaimed in Judea and then on into Samaria. And one of the men who proclaimed the gospel in Samaria was named Philip. He was one of the seven men chosen to serve the needy church in Jerusalem from Acts chapter 6. And as he is preaching the gospel in Samaria, uh, many people are believing and being baptized, including a man named Simon the Magician. And in our passage today, we're going to be seeing how Simon is an example of a counterfeit conversion. And we're going to be talking about the sober and serious reality of false conversion in our study today. So turn to Acts chapter 8. We'll read verses 9 through 25. If you're able, please stand in honor of the reading of God's inspired word. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized... He continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever and ever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we turn our attention now to your word and we study this counterfeit conversion, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fall afresh on us, that we might understand the danger of a false conversion to Christ. Lord, this is a sobering and a serious topic. And yet we want to hear your word speaking to us, that we might be sure that we are truly saved, that we are truly in Christ, that we are truly forgiven, and that we are truly possessors of eternal life. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would illumine our minds, that we might read, mark, and inwardly digest the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? Our passage today confronts us with the reality of counterfeit conversion. 
When I was a kid, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and when I was in elementary school, one of my favorite Sunday school teachers was Ben Fredrickson. He was kind, he was always smiling, he taught the Bible in a way that we could understand, and I loved Ben, and I was sure that he was a godly man if I had ever met one. But later, when I was in high school, Ben Fredrickson walked down the aisle during the invitation in our Southern Baptist Church, and he made a profession of faith in Christ. And standing beside the pastor, he explained how he had grown up in the church, how he had been baptized, how he had prayed and invited Jesus into his heart in the past, but how he had never truly been converted to Christ. He had never truly repented of his sin and placed his faith in Jesus Christ alone for his right standing with God. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, he had me fooled. He could give a credible profession of faith. He had received water baptism. He taught Sunday school for so many years, but by his own admission, he was a counterfeit convert. It's a scary thought, isn't it? That someone could profess faith and be baptized and carry on in the visible church for a period of time and yet not truly be born again. And yet, if you've studied church history, you know how common it is for people to have false conversions. I'll never forget D. James Kennedy, the founder of Evangelism Explosion and pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church once said that he believed that evangelical churches were full of false converts. People who claim to be Christians, many of them even think they are Christians, but do not have a true saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the reason I begin in this way is because in our passage, we have a man named Simon, who is called a magician or a sorcerer, who appeared to be converted under Philip's evangelistic ministry in Samaria. He professed faith. He received baptism. But as the passage unfolds, it becomes clear that Simon is a counterfeit convert. Peter tells him his heart's not right with God. Peter tells him that he has neither part nor lot in this matter. Peter tells him that he's going to perish along with his money. Peter tells him that he's still in the gall of bitterness and still in the bond of iniquity. And yet Simon had professed faith. Simon had been baptized. But Simon was wetter, but no better. He was not really converted to Jesus. And so as we look at this passage, I want us to be mindful of the fact that counterfeit conversion is a reality in the life of the church and I want us to see, as we walk through this passage, the way counterfeit conversion happens, how it's different from true conversion, and what we are to do if we discover ourselves to be false converts. First of all, this passage unfolds in three scenes, and the first scene we see here is in verses 9 through 13, where Simon appears to be converted. Now, who was this man named Simon? Well, the text tells us that he was living in Samaria. Um, it tells us that he was a magician, or perhaps a better word would be sorcerer. You know, when I think of magician, I think of David Copperfield or Harry Houdini or the guy you invite to your child's birthday party who pulls a rabbit out of a hat. But that's not what Simon was. Simon was a magician in the sense that he was involved in spiritualism and the occult and divination. He was probably involved in reading the stars and trying to find prophetic omens in the stars and charms and spells and things of that nature. And it, Simon really had a high self-esteem. It says that he thought of himself as somebody great. Uh, Simon loved Simon. And he was really uh, gaining a following there in Samaria before Philip came because notice the people say about him, this man is the power of God that is called great. And so he must have been quite the trickster 
Now, it is possible that Simon was performing some of his magical powers by trickery and sleight of hand, like magicians do today, but it is also possible that he had some demonic power that was enabling him to do things that were getting people's attention. But people say this blasphemous thing about him. They say he is great. He is the power of God, and people are surrounding him, and Simon is getting a lot of attention until... Philip shows up and steals the show. Philip is preaching the gospel, and signs and wonders are being performed. And many Samaritans are believing and being baptized and swept into the kingdom by God's amazing grace. And Simon sees this going on. And the text tells us that Simon himself, verse 13, believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now notice in verse 13 that it says Simon believed. There are places in the Bible where it says people believe, but it's not talking about saving faith. For example, in Luke chapter 8 in verse 13, when Jesus talks about uh, the parable of the sower, he talks about the rocky ground hearer. And in Luke 8.13, it says that that rocky ground here is the person who believes for a time, but then after a time of testing falls away. In other words, it's a false convert, someone who has a temporal faith, but not a true and saving faith. We also see this in John chapter 2, right before the scenario with Nicodemus in John 3. At the end of John chapter 2, it says in uh, verse 23 that when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But it goes on to say Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. There's a play on words in the Greek. It actually says that uh, these people believed in Jesus, but essentially Jesus didn't believe in them. So they believed because they saw the signs, much like Simon here believes because he sees the signs, he sees the power, and he's baptized, and he joins the church. You see a hint that something's not quite right. In verse 13, you, you, you see a description that sounds like Simon is genuinely converted, but then the, seeing signs and wonders, he's amazed. You can tell he's really just interested in the show. Uh, he's interested in the miracles that are being performed, and as the passage unfolds, that's what's driving Simon. He, he's driven by self. He wants the power of God on his life so that other people think he's great and wonderful. So I think in verse 13, when it says Simon himself believed, it means something like he appeared to believe. And, and I think that he must have been convincing because Philip baptized him. And I don't believe Philip would have baptized uh, a known hypocrite. I don't think Philip would have baptized someone who was obviously insincere or coming with false motives. And so Simon most, most likely gave a credible profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was baptized along with the other Samaritans. It's interesting, Simon himself experiences this apparent conversion under true preaching. We can't blame Philip's preaching as if it was defective. We're told that he was preaching the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of people often criticizing Billy Graham because the people who came down at his crusades, they weren't all converted. And someone once asked Billy Graham uh, what percentage of the people who come down and profess faith are actually converted. And Billy Graham said, well, probably as many in the parable of the sower, which I thought was a good response, a clever response. So counterfeit conversions can happen under faithful preaching. Also, it seems like these other Samaritans who are converted uh, are genuinely converted. So this counterfeit conversion is taking place alongside true conversions. Reminded of Jonathan Edwards who preached um, during the First Great Awakening and wrote a defense of revivals and said alongside any true revival or any true work of God, there's always Satan's counterfeit. Of course, we know Jesus spoke about the wheat and the tares, and of course there's the wheat, but there's also the tares that are sown by the evil one. And so you see this counterfeit conversion happening. You need to understand that it, it seemed real. But you know what? People are not always who they seem to be. 
Jesus said, don't judge according to outward appearances, but judge with right judgment. Sometimes people seem to be something, but they are not what they seem to be. This still happens today. You might have faithful preaching. You might have genuine conversions taking place. But among those genuine conversions, you have people who aren't really saved. And that's a scary thought, and we need to be aware of that. We also need to be aware that sometimes it is the preacher's fault. In this case, it wasn't. But if we tell people wrong things about the nature of conversion, we're bound to produce false converts. For example, in some churches, people are told that if you've been baptized with water, you're regenerated automatically by that water ritual. Well, if we tell people that, of course, if everyone who comes to the font is counted a Christian, there have got a lot of people who are going to have false conversions. Or sometimes we tell people if they've ever had a time in their life where they've prayed and invited Jesus into their heart, they're definitely saved. You're definitely going to have a bunch of false converts because some people do pray that prayer, but they never really repent. They never are really born again from the heart by a sovereign working of God. Some people think they're Christians just because they attend church or they taught Sunday school. But throughout the history of the church, there have even been ministers who are unconverted, professors of seminaries who are unconverted. That's no uh, assault against present company. That's just a reality that that has happened. John Wesley began his ministry as an unconverted minister. It does happen. And so you see the reality of this, con this false conversion as Simon appears to be converted. But notice as the passage un unfolds that in the next scene here, you see how Simon does eventually uh, reveal the true state of his heart. Simon reveals the true state of his heart in verses 14 through 20. So all of these people have believed, are appeared to believe, been baptized, but none of them have yet received the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we understand that? Well, obviously, in order to believe the gospel, you need to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit because the natural man cannot believe apart from the working of the Holy Spirit. But these Christians had not yet experienced the outward signs that would confirm the baptism of the Holy Spirit like the day of Pentecost. And so Peter and John come from Jerusalem now into this new region where the gospel has gone in Samaria, and they lay their hands on these new converts so that they receive the Holy Spirit. In the providence of God, God delayed their reception of the Holy Spirit to show the unity of the church in Samaria with the church in Jerusalem. Now, our Pentecostal friends would say that this is normative. They would say that you could be born again and then later receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as subsequent act of grace. But we would say that, uh, disagreeing with them in love, that this passage is actually talking about something that is unique in redemptive history. And that is, as the gospel went forward to new territories, first in Jerusalem to the Jews, and then the half-breeds, as it were, in Samaria, and then out among the Gentiles, God had the gift of the Holy Spirit delayed, the baptism, that is, and the outward confirmation of signs, so that it would become clear that the church in Samaria was one with the church in Jerusalem. Now we are told in many places in the New Testament, when we are born again and we are con truly converted, we receive the Holy Spirit at that time. For example, Romans 8, 9 says, no one has, so, someone who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 tells us, in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So this is describing something that is unique. Yet, we can see that true converts, as many of these Samaritans were, do receive the Holy Spirit. True converts receive the presence of God living in their lives. The Scripture tells us, by this we know that we have come to know Him, by the Spirit who's been given us. And the Spirit in Romans 8, 16 bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so the, the, the presence of the Spirit on these Samaritans who had genuinely believed certifies the authenticity of their conversion. But Simon's been left out, hasn't he? because Simon wants to purchase the power. Simon has some money. Uh, 
He's a wealthy man, he's a notable man, and he offers to buy this power so that he can lay hands on others and they receive the Holy Spirit. Because, of course, Simon hasn't received the Holy Spirit. Simon is not genuinely com converted. He has professed faith, he's been baptized, but he doesn't have the, the life of God and the soul of man. He doesn't have Christ living within. And so he wants to buy this power. And Peter gives him a little salty Galilean fisherman talk. May your silver and gold perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. This isn't for sale. None of God's gifts are for sale, by the way. Salvation isn't for sale. Ecclesiastical offices aren't for sale. The gift of the Holy Spirit isn't for sale. It's a free gift. But Simon wants to buy it. It's interesting. One translation suggested a paraphrase of what Peter says. To hell with you and your money. Pretty hard words. But Peter understands that Simon needs to be confronted because he has revealed the true state of his heart. So notice... The true state of his heart is revealed over time as he doesn't receive the Holy Spirit. And also you can see here, can you not, that Simon has not really renounced the idols of his heart. Simon is really just still concerned about the power. I want that power. He was calling himself someone great. People were calling him the great power of God. And now Philip has come to town preaching this Jesus stuff and everyone's paying attention to him now. Can I buy the power of God? He hasn't renounced the idols of his heart. You see, that is a reality when someone is not genuinely converted to Christ. They've never really repented of self. There have, some, there have been some people who've taught that it's possible to be a genuine convert and yet remain a carnal Christian, as if somehow self can remain on the throne and you're truly saved. You're saved but you're just not obeying the Lordship of Christ, or you've received Christ as Savior, but you've not really received Him as Lord. Nothing could be further from the teaching of the New Testament. If someone is genuinely converted by the grace of God, they renounce their hard idols, they repent, and they trust in Jesus alone to save them. You don't continue in the same idolatry. You don't continue to be the same old person. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. It couldn't be said of Simon. Simon is still interested in the power. He's still interested in the magic, in the sorcery, in the attention. In a bone-chilling book that I don't necessarily recommend you read, by A.W. Pink, he writes about saving faith. And in his day, A.W. Pink talks about how there are many people in churches who've been told that if they just invite Jesus into their heart, if they just accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, without bowing before Him as Lord, that they're saved. And nothing could be further from the truth. Remember, even in that watershed text in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. He is Lord. And obviously, sanctification is a, a lifelong process, but when you are converted, a new life is given to you, and you bow to Christ, receiving Him, yes, as Lord and Savior. He's not two different Jesuses. The one Jesus who saves us is Lord, and He is Savior. But Simon has never really bowed before the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, He's appeared. To be a Christian. If you were there before Peter and John came down from Samaria, you would say, Simon's legit. He believed and he was baptized along with everyone else. But as the passage unfolds by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, his heart is disclosed. And the true state of his heart is revealed. He's still in the bond of iniquity. He's still in the gall of bitterness. He is un converted. I can't see into your heart. None of the elders on the session can see into your heart. But in almost every local church, there are people who are on the rolls, who have professed faith and maybe even be regarded to be Christians and have never really been born from above. And the only person that knows the true state of your heart other than the Lord is you. 
And so there's a, there's a call here, I believe, to 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith. If you can make salvation just into a mechanical thing, like I've come to the font, I don't need to question my salvation. Or I've prayed a prayer, I don't need to question my salvation. Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 13 would be nonsensical. Because he writes to a professing Christian community, and he says, examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. And by the way, he goes on to say, don't you realize Christ is in you? That's the key. Is Christ living in your heart? Do you have a relationship with Christ as Lord and Savior? Are you trusting in Him? Have you renounced your self-will and truly depended on Jesus alone for your right standing with God? And do you know that as the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit? Or are you just an outward professing Christian? By their fruits you will know them. Time will tell. It will reveal the true state of your heart as it did with Simon, and it did very quickly with Simon, didn't it? It came to be seen. So Simon appears to be converted, but Simon reveals the true state of his heart. And then notice this final scene here. Peter calls Simon to true conversion. Peter says three different things to Simon. He says, Simon, number one, your heart is not right with God. Number two, he says, Simon, you need to repent. And number three, he says, Simon, you need to pray for forgiveness. And essentially, those three things that Peter said to Simon are the same three things that could be said to any counterfeit convert. First, you have to realize the problem. Your heart is not right with God. Secondly, you have to realize that you need to repent. That R word that is so often escapes the vocabulary of gospel ministers. You need to repent. And you need to pray for forgiveness. How did Peter know that Simon's heart was not right with God? Well, the Holy Spirit must have revealed it to him. And the Holy Spirit revealed it to him through his desire to purchase the Holy Spirit. So it became clear by the way Simon was behaving that his heart was not right with God. Some people think that just because you don't know someone's heart with those Holy Spirit glasses, you can't know their heart. Well, your heart is revealed by your deeds. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so Peter has re realized that this man's heart is totally wrong. That's what happened to my Sunday school teacher. He realized his heart was not in the right place. Yes, he smiled. Yes, he taught good Bible studies. Yes, he was kind, but he was Christless in his heart. He didn't know and love the Lord Jesus in his heart. He didn't place all of his faith in Jesus Christ for his righteousness. He did not repent. He had never been born again. So there's a need for a heart examination. And it frightens me that there are many kinds of churches that people could attend where sermons would be preached that would never require you to examine your heart. One of the marks of Puritan preaching was the call for introspection, the call for heart examination. The Puritans were masterful at calling men and women, boys and girls within the visible church to search their hearts for the marks of genuine saving faith. And you see an absence of that in the church today. You see a superficiality, superficial preaching, superficial conversions, superficial church. And we are called upon to genuinely consider the state of our souls when we read things like this. So Peter says, your heart's not right. And then he says, repent. In verse 22, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours. We've seen that word repent included in every single sermon in the book of Acts, haven't we? That's what Peter said to the Jews who had crucified Christ on the day of Pentecost. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus preached following John the Baptist. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent 
and believe the gospel. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And Peter has preached repentance. Stephen, that first martyr of the Christian church, preached repentance and got stoned for it. And so we are called upon to repent. Repent means that we have a change of heart and a change of mind about our sin. And we turn away from sin and we turn to Jesus. So repentance and faith are inseparable. You can't turn to Jesus as Savior without turning away from sin. His name is Jesus, the one who saves his people from their sins. And so the whole concept of I'll have him as Savior and not as Lord is nonsensical. But repentance and faith mean we have an about face. Yes, it starts with a change of heart, change of mind, but it results in a 180 degree turn away from sin. It's a U-turn. Repentance is God's U-turn. Turning away from sin to Christ and receiving Him alone for your pardon and also for power over sin. Of course, we cannot repent by our own strength. It is only the power of the Holy Spirit who enables us to be convicted of our sin and renounce our sin and turn away from it to the lordship of the king. But Peter tells Simon, you need to repent. And he also says, you need to pray for forgiveness. Pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Now, I want to correct a possible misinterpretation of that line. When Peter says, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you, he doesn't mean that there is anything in God that would not forgive a sinner who comes to him in repentance and faith. God is abundant in grace and mercy, and the only thing that keeps us from a full abundant pardon is our own impenitence. So there's no God might forgive you, you know, as if God doesn't have a disposition towards mercy and grace and forgiveness. We see that throughout the Bible. The question is whether or not Simon will genuinely repent and seek the Lord's forgiveness. And so he needs to pray for forgiveness. He needs to have a one-on-one -on -one time with God. He needs to engage in that business of the soul and going to God and asking for mercy and asking for forgiveness and not leave that encounter with God until he knows for sure that all of his sins are forgiven. Peter tells him, you're still in the slavery of sin. I would take guts to tell somebody that, wouldn't it? But the Holy Spirit has empowered Peter again and again to have the boldness to confront those who need to be confronted, the same way he was with Ananias and Sapphira when he confronted them. We need to pray for forgiveness if we realize that we are not truly converted. Counterfeit converts are an offense against God because they play the hypocrite in the side of the church and in the side of the watching world. Oh, he claims to be a Christian, but sure doesn't live like it. I don't know how many times I've heard, especially in a town like Waynesboro, where almost everybody claims to be a Christian. I know it's not everybody, but almost everybody claims to be a Christian. Friends, it cannot be. And many people who claim to be Christians and speak Christian platitudes and sometimes even cover sinister intentions with Christianese, it's really sickening, reveal the true state of their heart. And it dishonors God. And so it's not just, I mean, we all need to pray for forgiveness for our many sins, but a counterfeit convert especially needs to cry out, Lord, I'm sorry for pretending to be something that I'm not. And take off the mask. This is the wonderful thing about the gospel. You don't have to wear the mask. Take off the mask. Expose yourself for who you are, a sinner, deserving God's wrath and displeasure. And know that when you take off that mask, you find the embrace of the Lord Jesus Christ who loves to receive the penitent who cling to him in faith alone. 
You know, it's kind of sad to me that I don't think there's any evidence that Simon took Peter's words to heart. There's a lot of debate um, about the reliability of what the early church fathers say about Simon. Justin Martyr said that Simon later became a heretic and advocated for the heresy known as Gnosticism, and he has a lot of different things to say about Simon, and there are a couple other church fathers that mention him, and all the records are bad. People debate the details and how do you get to the historical core of that, but all the details are bad, and you kind of see here that even in the way it ends, it's kind of like with the rich young ruler who went away sad, you know, here Simon doesn't seem to be repentant. He says, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you said may come upon me. He's still thinking about himself. I don't want any of that bad stuff come on me. Peter said, you pray. Simon said, pray for me. You know, I've heard those words of Simon before when I've been talking to people in the community or other people who claim to be Christians and talking about the nature of true salvation in the gospel. You know how many times I've actually heard someone say to me, pray for me, pastor. I'm happy to pray for you, but you need to pray for yourself. You need, I can't repent for you. I can't believe for you. I can't be converted for you. You must be born again. Reminded of George Whitfield, who was preaching about the new birth again and again and again, and someone said to, me, said to George Whitfield, why do you always go and tell people you must be born again? And he said, because you must be born again. New life in Jesus Christ. Well, I pray that somewhere way down the road, Simon experienced true conversion, but I, I would love to see him in heaven and hear his story, but... Again, there's no evidence of that. He probably just continued in the same state he was in. As one who loved magic, loved sorcery, loved to be called the power of God, but never really repented of self. I don't want anyone in my church to go down that road. Now, I can't... I've seen our church roles... And I know the people who claim to be Christians in our church, and I cannot know their hearts. But I do know my heart, and my heart is, I don't want a single soul to perish who's a member in good standing of this church. But if I am really to let you know that and prove that I really care about that, I have to tell you, that just your name being on the church roll or just because you prayed a prayer or just you threw a stick in the fire at camp one year or some other pastor patted you on the back and said, don't, you were questioning your salvation and pastor patted you on the back and said, don't worry about it, you prayed and invited Jesus in your heart. It would not be faithful of me to tell you, you're fine. But you need to know for sure that you are converted based on the authority of God's word and based on the testimony of the Holy Spirit bearing witness with your spirit in your own heart. I can't give you that assurance. Only Jesus can. The good news, of course, is that Jesus is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who receives sinners. Jesus is the one who paid the price for all of our sins through his death on the cross. Jesus is the one who conquered death by raising again. Jesus is the one who says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Who is always inviting sinners to come to him and who invites you to come, even if you are a hypocrite, even if you are a counterfeit convert, it's never too late to come to Jesus until you're dead. Then it will be too late. But coming to Christ in true belief and true repentance is so essential because there are so many who experience an emotional experience or something else and yet are not truly born from above. When I was a camp counselor, when I was in seminary, uh, we had a camp in Ironton, Missouri for uh, kids from our church, but also kids from the inner city that we would bus in. And one night I was in uh, 
the cabin with the, another leader and the guys who were in our cabin, and there was a kid in our group named Sherrod. And Sherrod started talking to me about spiritual things. And we had a long conversation. And into the wee hours of the night, I was proclaiming Christ to him and calling him to faith in Jesus. And I was amazed. Tears streamed down his face. He knelt down beside the bed, cried out for God to save him. I later baptized him at that, that camp. I mean, all the signs were there. But over time, Sherrod didn't come to church. He got involved in a gang. He murdered somebody, and now he's in prison. Now, I pray that he was genuinely converted, and that was just an inconsistency in his newfound Christian life. But I fear that just in that camp experience... He had an emotional experience and maybe even felt like he believed. But he believed for a time, and then he fell away. If we didn't have categories from the Word of God to explain those situations, we would be left to wonder. But since we do have the categories, we ought to speak of them honestly and call people to the truth. Look to Jesus Christ alone for your right standing with God. Turn your back on self and fall into the arms of the only one who can save you. Let's pray. Father, these have been serious words, but there's no way to preach on this passage without getting into the, the issue, the serious issue that is often not discussed, this reality of counterfeit conversion. Lord, I pray that my words have been spoken in love, truth and love, but I know that your Holy Spirit can overcome any weaknesses that are in my own, my delivery or in my own heart and seal this message to the hearts of your own people. Lord, I pray for every person in the sanctuary today that they would have a true and sound conversion, a true conviction of their sinfulness, a true recognition that Jesus is the Son of God, who came to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again, and that if we turn away from sin and trust in him, we are forgiven and reconciled to you. And I pray that they would have the testimony of the Holy Spirit bearing witness with their spirits that they are your children and the fruit of the Holy Spirit that would demonstrate the authenticity of a real conversion. We pray, Lord, that that would be true of every single one of us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.